Hello, everyone, and welcome to the webcast. My name is Christine Dorsey Davis. I'm the executive director of the Ohio chapter of the American Planning Association, and I am your webcast moderator. Today is Friday, June 11th, and we will hear the presentation Lessons in New Ruralism. For your uh, for technical help during today's webcast, you can type your questions in the chat box found in your GoToWebinar tool panel. And for content questions related to the presentation, again, just type those in that chat box and we'll answer those at the end of the presentation during the Q&A. Coming up next on your screen is a list of our sponsoring APA chapters and divisions for 2021. Thanks to all those participating sponsors for making these webcasts possible and free to members. Today, we are sponsored by STAR, the Small Town and Rural uh, Planning Division of APA. So thanks to you for bringing this session to us and um, we thank you. To log your credits for attending today's session, just head over to planning.org, log into your My APA account, and from there you can either search by today's title or event number, both of which can be found on our webcast webpage, ohioplanning.org slash planningwebcast. Uh, and the session has been approved for 1.5 CM credits for live viewing, so don't forget to log those credits. Um, be sure to like us on Facebook, just search Planning Webcast Series and we'll pop up. That's where I post any important timely information like date or time changes, and also when we have new sessions available for you to register for. So be sure to like us and subscribe to our YouTube channel. Again, just search Planning Webcast Series, we'll pop up. Uh, we record all of our sessions and we post them on our YouTube channel. So by subscribing, you'll get notified uh, when we have a new session available. Uh, we have a ton of upcoming sessions. We're actually booked, I think, through October now at this point. So be sure to head over to our, again, our, our website, ohioplanning.org slash planningwebcast, and there you can register for all of our upcoming sessions, and you can um, get links to our recordings and PDF copies of all of our sessions. So be sure and do that. Um, that's the end of my housekeeping. Again, when you have questions, just type them in the chat box. We'll answer those at the end during our Q&A for today. Um, so don't raise your hand or anything like that because we won't be calling on you. Just type your questions in the chat box. And um, I am going to now turn things over and we can get started. So Tara Bamford, you're up first. So I'm gonna turn that over to you and change the presenter over to Jenny. Okay. You're good to go. Thank you, Christine, and thank you for all the work you do behind the scenes to make these webinars happen. I have a whole new appreciation of that now. Um, uh, can we see the agenda slide, Jenny? I'm going to do a TED Talk size introduction to New Oralism and to the New Oralism Initiative and then hand it over to Jenny to talk about a few examples of our collection of case studies where we'll get to hear directly from the local leaders and then hear Jenny's thoughts on some key ingredients of a successful grassroots initiative. Next slide, please. And while new urbanism was getting a lot of attention and planning as a way to combine the best in the old, of the old and new to produce more vibrant, livable, walkable villages and downtowns, Many of us working in rural areas were noticing some equally exciting things going on, making small towns better places to live and work and be more self-sufficient, kind of a rural renaissance. In Northern New England, we saw great things happening all around us, creative grassroots organized initiatives to tackle everyday challenges, food systems and job creation, to aging in place, children's programs. Next slide, please. <clears throat> we observed patterns to these examples that we were looking at, things they had in common. Like new urbanism, many examples seem to include the best features of the old and new. They celebrated the community and the heritage, but embraced modern technology. For example, the Renewable Energy Initiative in New Hampshire's Plymouth area began with an approach based on the old time barn raisings, where communities would gather to erect each other's barns. Only this time you would volunteer as part of a group at someone else's home to learn how to install solar hot water 
and the group would come to your home and do the same, and you'd bring your new skills to help the next one. Next. A lot of what we saw seemed like uh, individualism within community, community empowerment and individual empowerment. At the meetings of the Northern New England chapter of the APA, where these conversations were taking place, we decided to take back the term New Worldism to describe this rural renaissance that focused on both empowerment of individuals and community building. And with very few exceptions, such as Ben Hewitt's The Town That Food Saved about Hardwick, Vermont, most of what we saw written about rural areas was focused on their service to urban areas rather than their own importance as places to live and work in their own right. Next. I keep saying we. The New Realism team is actually an ad hoc group of volunteers with no formal structure. Maybe a good example of New Realism. We all just pitch in when and where we can to keep the project going. This is the current makeup. Peg Elmerhoff and Mark Lapping started the ball rolling with their conversations at the Northern New England chapter meetings. Joanne Carr, Lynn Seeley, and I hopped in right off the bat for the Northern New England pilot. Chad Naberty has been our uh, liaison with the Small Town and Rural Planning Division, bringing us the funding to hire Jenny Whitaker to conduct the national rollout, who by now, like the rest of us today, has stayed on as a volunteer to help with outreach at, at events like today. I'll say, take the opportunity to say we're always on the lookout for new volunteers if any of you have an interest in pursuing some aspect of the project, whether it's outreach, looking for new case studies to add to our library, or helping maintain the website. <clears throat> We've been fortunate to have funding along the way to obtain the help of interns for research and writing initially from the APA Chapter President's Council and the Northern New England Chapter of the APA. And as I said, more recently, we, we received a Divisions Council grant from STAR that, that brought us Jenny's help. Next. Our shared goal is to help citizens in rural areas learn about successful grassroots initiatives in other small towns and what lessons they had to share. These lessons are often helpful whether the initiative is addressing the exact same issue or not. We wanted citizens working on projects in rural areas not to feel so isolated and so much like they had to reinvent every wheel. We wanted to provide a way that they could at least read about similar examples and possibly even connect to someone else who's done something similar and pick their brain a bit. First, we had to explain what we meant by New Worldism. We decided it was best described rather than defined. I kept saying, we know it when we see it. And we all know that stories resonate with people much better than data. We crowdsourced this set of criteria with a group of 20 professional planners in Northern New England. I'm sure it will evolve as time goes on, but it's our working tool for now. Besides being a good fit for rural communities, we felt another important element is that the long-term success of the initiative not be dependent on outside staff or funding. We look for locally driven programs to meet local needs. As many of you who work in rural areas are aware, many small communities don't even have one full-time town staffer. Everything is accomplished by the same core group, handful of local volunteers, they're lucky with a little bit of guidance from folks like you, regional planners in some areas, extension staff and others, sometimes nonprofit. <clears throat> we also felt it was important that our examples be sustainable. Next slide, please. In the economic sphere, to us, that meant reducing leakage. When profits mainly go to corporate owners and stockholders outside the rural area rather than to local owners and employees. In the environmental sphere, it meant if we're talking about working landscape, we see stewardship based on long-term goals. In the social sphere, we look for both community building and empowerment of individuals. This means cooperatives, community building programs that help individuals be more independent, like programs that organize volunteers to help seniors age in place. Next. By now we have a library of 20 case studies 
The library is hosted on the Northern New England chapter of the APA website. It's easier to find than that. Google APA New Worldism, APA New Worldism, and it should be the first hit. Next. We've organized our library into these categories, although all of them further more than one local goal. For the sake of organizing, we've set up food systems, programs that serve kind of special needs of children or seniors, economic development, energy efficiency, and then some others that were just unique. Next. <clears throat> After starting out as a Northern New England pilot project through our partnership with the Small Town and Rural Planning Division and a Division Council's grant, we were able to engage Jenny Whitaker to research and write up several more examples from around the country, and then to look at all 20 case studies together to think about what the common elements were, what lessons we could derive from our work so far that will help others just starting out. Before I hand it over to Jenny to take a closer look at a few of our case studies and to summarize the findings of her report, I want to say congratulations. Yesterday, APA announced that Jenny's work with us was chosen for the 2021 Divisions Council Award for a contribution to the profession. Jenny, I want to thank you for upping our game and hand it over to you. Thank you so much, Tara. It's, I think it's really been a team effort and I've been really Delighted to, to be able to come on to this team that was already um, working very smoothly well before I joined. So thank you. Um, so as Tara shared today, um, our library of case studies has grown to about 20 case studies that are featuring communities um, from New England to, um, to the South to Alaska, um, all of which display these characteristics of new ruralism. Um, each of the projects addresses a specific need in that rural community from investing in the arts to addressing senior housing to providing services for families with children. Um, today, we're going to zoom in on four of our featured communities and hear directly from them how they are investing in the needs of their community. Um, we're starting all the way up north in Skowhegan, Maine. Um, and then heading down to Camden, Alabama. Uh, next, we'll hear from folks in Frewsburg, New York, before going all the way over to Kodiak, Alaska. Um, when we developed the case studies, we spent a really significant amount of time interviewing stakeholders in these communities who were instrumental in the development and the growth of the featured projects. Um, so we're really excited for them to now be able to tell a small piece of their own story today. Um, so starting out, we'll hear from Maine Grains, which is a grist mill that turned into a community catalyst in Skowhegan. So Christine, would you be able to pull up our first video with the folks from Skowhegan? Absolutely. Hello everyone, my name is Amber Lamke from Maine Grains in Skowhegan, Maine. I'm pleased to be able to share a little bit of our story here in Maine, developing a grist mill, which has been influential in reviving the infrastructure to make a local grain economy possible here again, to serve bakers, brewers, and chefs throughout the Northeast. Our story really begins in 2007, uh, at a time when I was doing a lot of volunteer work with our Main Street program. Uh, Main Street is a program of the National Trust for Historic Preservation, a proven method for helping to revive uh, regional um, downtowns that have um, fallen on hard times. And Skowhegan was coalescing uh, around the Main Street approach when I was asked to be a volunteer with our local farmers market. Farmers markets have become quite popular and can be a centerpiece of a downtown. Uh, and in our volunteerism uh, to grow the market, we realized that grains uh, for bread bakers were really missing from the conversation. So together with a grassroots group of folks here in Skowhegan, we decided we would pull together bakers, brewers, 
uh, wood-fired oven builders, researchers uh, to talk about what it would take to grow grains in our region again. Maine was actually a rich producer of grains in the mid 1800s, uh, producing far more than our population could consume at that time. So we were a net exporter of grains uh, in the mid 1800s, back when grains were planted and harvested by hand and horse. So uh, we knew that it was possible here, but we also recognized that we were missing the infrastructure and the know-how here in Maine. So we started an event called the Kneading Conference, K-N-E-A-D, and uh, it became a um, national and globally recognized event for having conversations about the revival of regional grains. We started working with farmers and trying to understand uh, if grains worked into their organic crop rotations on their farm, uh, and they were. Grains are actually important for uh, animal feed and straw, as well as for human food. And a business partner and I, you know, a good friend of mine, we set our sights on writing the business plan to start a mill that would solve the infrastructure challenges here in the state. We were missing key pieces of machinery to be able to crack the husky coating off of an oat, for example, and be able to eat the inside. Um, we didn't have machines in the state anymore that could take off the weed seeds uh, that get mixed into the grain when the combine comes through and harvests the grain. So these things were necessary to reinvigorate um, an economic opportunity in grains. And so we built a business plan um, for a couple of years between the years of 2007 and nine. And when it came time to figure out where to put our mill, uh, we worked with our Main Street program and local officials to consider this old county jail building in our downtown. Uh, the old Somerset County Jail, which is a Victorian structure built in the late 1800s, uh, was coming up for sale because the county was gonna move the jail outside of town uh, to build, building a new jail outside of town. And this structure that we're in uh, and ended up purchasing is a four-story building. And what we had learned about milling was that vertical height is advantageous because you can send grain to the top of a facility and gravity feed through machines on the way down. So we worked closely with our town officials, uh, the county government, as well as local economic developers, developers to align our goals uh, with the milling business and with the revival of grains uh, to the master plan that the town had for focusing on our natural resources in this area um, and our local food um, uh, hub, if you will. So um, by aligning our goals and being able to see out into the future that um, grains and the growing of grains was really a good fit for our region, we have uh, open available farmland. We have uh, organic dairy farmers nearby who are um, good bets at starting to grow grains um, in partnership with us. Um, and we are a community that is trying to focus on its local food economy, made this a great idea for our community. Um, we, we worked to communicate the vision of this, um, of this mill, uh, which was launched in 2012 under the name Maine Grains. And we've invited um, local officials to partner with us in every which way. So not only from the planning side and making sure that our local government was aligned in our goals here, uh, but also to finance these kinds of projects uh, in rural small communities. It was difficult for us to seek traditional financing uh, at, at banks, and it really required a team of folks uh, to help us get this off the ground. We ended up working very closely with some of the economic developers in our community to write grants together. Uh, economic development agencies could serve as a fiscal sponsor, uh, as a nonprofit, to sponsor some of the grant writing and, and the receipt of grant funds toward the build out of this infrastructure, making it uh, feasible for us to launch this business. In the end, Main Grains, which is now uh, had, uh, in its ninth year of operation, we are processing flour and rolled oats and grains for bakers, brewers and chefs throughout the Northeast. And we have really um, not only spurred the revival of the regional grain economy, which includes bread and beer and tortillas uh, and even uh, ice cream sandwich cookies and pasta and frozen pizza dough now. Um, 
we really have realized the power of an infrastructure project at the center of our town to spur more economic development and spin off projects as inspired entrepreneurs in our community uh, are feeling uh, ready to take risks as we did. And also um, many of these new entrepreneurs can benefit from the initial connections and frameworks that we created to be able to get this project off the ground. So while it's a challenge um, to, to tackle projects and ways of doing things in a new way, uh, we've certainly realized the catalytic and the transformative effect that Main Grains, Grist Mill, and all of the enterprises located in our building now um, and co-located with us on the campus of this old jail building um, have had, um, this project has had a uniting effect for our community. It has inspired more risk taking um, and we're thrilled to look ahead to our future of growth here in Skowhegan, which includes continuing to, to inspire more entrepreneurs and more um, businesses that highlight local food as one of our greatest assets here in rural Maine. So once again, I thank you for the opportunity to speak with you today and encourage you to hear more about our story at maingrains.com. Thanks very much. Thanks very much. Okay. Well, thank you so much, Christine, for playing the video. Um, so just as Amber uh, shared about how an individual project became a catalyst for a lot of spin-off projects and growth throughout the community related to local foods, um, the folks from Black Belt Treasures in Camden, Alabama, um, are going to describe how investment in local arts and craftsmen has um, turned into a regional economic development and growth. Um, so, Christine, if you could go ahead and play that second video, please. Thank you. I'm Sue Lynn Kressel, the Executive Director at Black Belt Treasures Cultural Arts Center in Camden, Alabama. And with me is Kristen Law, who is the Arts Programs and Marketing Director for our organization and we are one of the two, we are two of the <laughs> two uh, full-time staff that work here. We're located in Camden, Alabama, which is in the heart of um, the Black Belt of Alabama, which is named for its soil. And just so you can have a visual, um, this is the Black Belt that we represent and we're right in the center of it. Um, we were started as a nonprofit organization, a, a separate entity from the uh, Alabama Regional Commission, but we were actually started as a result of a tourism initiative that they were doing back in 2004, where they had um, help from the University of Alabama Center for Economic Development in assessing those um, places within their region that um, actually would be sites that would attract tourists. And as they did that assessment, they discovered a plethora of very talented artists and craftsmen, many of whom were folk artists, and were actually um, doing work that had been handed down from one generation to another. Mm -hmm. And so the decision was made to begin Black Belt Treasures as a way of marketing to the outside world, the um, beauty of our region, as well as the talent and cultural heritage of our region. At that point, um, the Black Belt of Alabama was getting much negative press. We have um, the issues of poverty and um, high unemployment rates, um, education that um, the systems are often broken um, throughout the counties. And there was much negative press that was taking place at that point. And so this was a way that we could address those issues while at the same time focusing attention 
for um, our residents as well as those from the outside world to focus on, on things that were um, really great assets within the Black Belt. And so um, the building was purchased and funding uh, was acquired that came to us through USDA, the Delta Regional Authority, um, local foundations, um, and, and just pieces of funding wherever it could be found to make it possible for us to begin. We started out working with about 75 artists and craftsmen and today has, have worked with more than 700. And um, while our focus at that time was very much um, on economic development and tourism, we have since grown an education program as well. And I'll let uh, Kristen tell you about that in just a moment. The artists receive 70% of the retail price of anything we sell in our gallery. And we retain 30% to help us um, with the operating costs. We are fortunate today in that we receive some funding through um, our state education fund budget, which helps to stabilize um, what we're able to do and how we're able to deliver programming. And would you like to tell us a little bit more about the arts education programs? Absolutely. And we, when we say arts education, we mean both in-school programs, after-school programs, creative art classes for youth, also continuing adult classes for um, experienced artists to the beginning artists. So we can have a drawing class, we may have a weaving class, basket weaving, chair caning, stained glass, quilting, of course, painting, encaustics, mixed media, and um, with the recent addition, pottery. Um, my degree is in ceramics and pottery, and we've built a pottery studio, and we have two studio artists here doing that. Of course, um, throughout the Black Belt, Susan mentioned education is one of the major issues, and of course, with all the proof that arts can help increase grades and um, build students throughout their entire lives and careers. So we try to help focus on that because almost none of the schools throughout the Black Belt have a formal arts education program. And if they do, it may be one day a week or two days a week. And so we do take our artists through a Black Belt teaching artist program and um, train our artists through an extensive program where they are trained both through us and our partners. Partnerships, partnerships, very important through the State Arts Council, the Alabama Art Alliance, um, and other educational partners. And we make sure that they are trained to go into the schools to deal with any situations that may occur. But also all of our programs include the rich cultural history and the arts of the Black Belt region. And then for the adults, we have, like I said, artist classes just for those who want to learn about the arts, who want to have fun, but also to help strengthen those artists who are already um, creating wonderful products. And so we have a great program that's called um, Arts Cultivate. And sorry, I was going back to our old name for it for a <laughs> second there. Arts Cultivate. And we train at the business class. It starts out with telling your story, marketing your um, products, and all the way to the legal side and um, business side of art. And just to make our artists better, stronger business people, and to succeed. Be, um, have a better chance of success in their creative arts. Uh, like Sulin said, we have some artists who are folk artists, some who are trained, some who do this for fun, and others who it truly makes a difference in their lives. We've seen artists who have cried because their power was getting cut off the next day and a $200 check for the baskets that she wove were going to make the difference between her electricity getting cut off and others who they say it just supports their habits. So um, it's, it's great, important work, and we are just proud to be a part of it. Just today, we've had visitors here from California, uh, from other parts of our state, and um, Georgia. Georgia. Mm -hmm. And we um, are seeing, have seen visitors from all 50 states and 32 other countries who have come 
um, an hour off the interstate into this rural community with a, about 2,500 people who live here um, to see what we're doing and then to travel on to um, see other artists and craftsmen throughout the region and to visit other small communities in our region. Right. So um, this has been um, an adventure for us as we each and every day um, hold something new. Um, today, we have been learning to make rag rugs so that we can then teach them to um, students in a smaller community about 20 miles from us. Um, so that's just an example of right. a day's work. And to add to that, we also are working on our five-year plan because we are in our 15th year or going into our 16th year, in our 16th year. And so as we move forward, uh, things have obviously changed since 2005. And we've done an addition with the new arts education classroom, uh, growing technology offerings so that if there's ever another pandemic, we hope not, we'll be prepared to go into the classrooms and assist with that. Um, and also to reach people outside of our community. We've had a lot of requests for art classes from states beyond and even other countries. And so we want to be able to grow there. We have a fully functioning pottery studio classroom. And we're working on the plans for our next edition, which will include artist incubator spaces, uh, working studio spaces like the one that we are in, which is Betty Anderson. She has a little museum and makes G's Bend last soap and old dolls made out of G's Bend old quilts and scrap fabrics and pipe cleaners. And, um, uh, and also we are working on a studio artist residency program. So we've got a lot of great things that are also coming and changing and growing. So we hope Black Belt Treasures will be around for many years to come. Thank you so much for this opportunity. And should any of you have any questions, feel free to contact us at Black Belt Treasures. Thank you. Okay, so after hearing about two projects that um, blossomed into economic development for a region, our next featured community, which is in Cruisburg, New York, uh, shares a kind of a different story of how investing in children and youth and supporting families really brought a lot of life back into a small downtown. We're going to head to Frewsburg next. Um, hi, I'm Lisa Lyon. I'm with the Relief Zone Community Youth Center in Frewsburg. I am the executive director here. And uh, we're located in Western New York, a small rural town. Um, our organization started in 2000 uh, to meet the needs within our community. One of the basic needs that we were meeting to begin with was uh, youth outreach. We had some volunteers within our community that were looking for a safe place for youth to be able to get together and interact with each other and engage with each other in a positive and uh, structured environment. So we had some volunteers that got together and approached a church, which is where our facility is now. It's the old United Methodist Church. And the church had been vacant because they had merged with another church. So they um, approached them to see if we might be able to utilize the facility. And they said yes. So it was the parents got together and the churches actually partnered with them along with other community organizations, businesses, the school district uh, to provide an outreach program for youth within our community. Um, that's where we started. Um, where we are now, uh, 21 years later, um, we're focusing mainly on uh, school-age childcare, which is UPK through sixth grade. Uh, we're providing programs for before school, after school, um, half day programs, summer day camp program, which also includes enrichment and um, tutoring of components with those programs. And we've been able to do that through collaborating with a multitude of organizations. Um, we've gone from having one program that we're running, which is our, our youth program, into um, taking that many different levels into many different things. Um, over the years, we've had 
um, other programs that we've done, but we're focusing on this child care programming right now. That's what's really uh, struck a chord within our community and a need within our community. As a community-based organization, basically what we want to do is provide services and programs that meet the needs within our community. So school-age child care is the main thing that we're focused on at this point. We have uh, New York State Office of Children and Family Services licensed programming. So we have three separate sites that we're providing programs at right now that we have licensed and we're running those. Uh, one of the things that got us to where we're at was in starting out, we had um, one main person, which is our visionary founder, Roxanne Miller, a parent of a teen and a bunch of other parents. So it was volunteers coming together that had a passion and perseverance for making something happen within our community. It's a small rural community, there's not a lot to do, and we wanted to make sure that kids weren't getting into trouble in their spare time. So um, taking that and taking it to the next level of reaching out to those around us, collaborating with those around us, partnering with those around us to make things happen. So it just took that force of individuals and that determination to make it, to see it through. So it was giving it legs to stand on, I guess. Doing it by yourself would be very difficult, um, but when you have others supporting you and surrounding you that share the same passion and the same vision, it made it so much easier to move it forward because you had that strength and that support and that um, uh, just that determination with each other and just to move together, that teamwork. <clears throat> Um, over the years, like I said, we've grown into many different programs. Our school age child care programming is what we do and we're doing quite well right now. Um, we have learned a lot over the years, um, especially over this past year, 2020, with the pandemic hitting. Um, we've learned a lot of lessons. Um, one of the things I think that is very key into uh, continuing on with your organization and seeing it move forward Again, like I said, is collaboration, collaborating with and partnering with as many people and other organizations as you can. Um, we've been able to collaborate with a lot of organizations right within our community. Our school district has come on board with us. We're able to work with them. They provide busing for our students to and from our site. Um, we've used the school as one of our sites. Um, we also have local businesses that partner with us and support us, churches that support us. Um, and individuals all supporting us financially. We also have live in a, in a county that has a rich um, philanthropic um, foundational organizations. So there's many foundations within our community that we're able to apply for and receive funding from uh, as a not-for-profit and as a service organization. So opening those doors was another thing that was um, key, I think, in our success as our organization. Uh, it's just developing those relationships with those funders within the area too. So, um, and that's, you know, talk with other organizations that are like yours and um, see, you know, how did they get to where they were at? Like, who do they need to talk to? Who can, you know, find organizations that are similar and are providing the same types of services so that you are not um, trying to reinvent the wheel, you know? And we've been in organizations that as we've moved along, we've had other organizations contact us and ask us, how did you do that? And how did you get there? And, and we've been able to guide other, um, other towns of our same size to the same type of things that we're doing. We actually have uh, one of our child care sites is in, a, is in a neighboring town. We were able to go into their, their town and into their elementary school and license an after school program for them there um, so that they could have the same benefit that we have in our town where we're be able to provide childcare um, and not just childcare, but programming that involves other things too, like um, enrichment and academic um, soft skills. So kids are learning, you know, please and thank you and, you know, things like that. Um, and we also have, currently we have other organizations in other towns that have contacted us and are asking us the same type of thing. How can we do what you're doing in our school district and with our, with our community? So um, I would say, you know, if you're looking into starting something, if you're, you know, you're passionate about it, surround yourself with people that are passionate about the same thing and collaborate with as many people as you can. Um, listen to what your community is telling you about, um, you know, what their needs are, like, and about what you're doing as your organization. 
Uh, I know with our organization, we try to put out surveys and get information back from teachers, from, from parents, from the students, from um, just community members on what they think and what they see is going on with our organization. And we take that information and use it, not as criticism, but as, you know, how can we better ourselves? And that's another thing is you need to constantly be um, adapting and updating and moving forward with your programming or it becomes stagnant. So you have to be very flexible and you have to be willing to make those changes um, as you go along the way. And that definitely has been something that 2020 to 2021 has taught us is that we've had to pivot on a dime and do different things. You know, school shut down, we have to ban, we move from school programming for and after to we're running full day programming so that we can keep parents working and kids can keep um, you know, getting their schoolwork done remotely at our site. So um, a lot a lot of change has happened over the past year and you just have to kind of take that with a grain of salt and you have to be flexible and you have to be um, able to, to, to move and to, to adapt and to, to do different things. And then just learning from past experiences. I mean, we've learned from a lot of different, um, from successes and from failures as, as we're, we go along and try to make sure that we don't go back and make the same mistakes twice. And, um, and always seek advice um, seek people around you that can, can um, you know, guide you in, as you make decisions. I know we have a board of, our board of directors is our um, governance and they are very good to work with and I appreciate them and, and they have a lot to throw into the program and, and they come from such different backgrounds that it's nice to have um, that support and that, that strength in having um, for the community organization that we run. So, um, that's basically the relief zone in a nutshell. Um, we are really excited about what we're doing and what we're able to provide to the community. And uh, we just are grateful to be part of this presentation and just would like to, to thank you. Um, like to thank you for thank allowing us to be part of this. Thank you for allowing us to be part of this. Okay, so lastly, our friends in Kodiak, Alaska uh, are working to restore a healthy local food system while addressing food insecurity through the Kodiak Harvest Food Co-op. Um, Christine, that'll be our last video for today. Hi everyone, my name is Tiffany Perez and I'm the project director for the Kodiak Harvest Food Cooperative in Kodiak, Alaska. Thank you so much for having me today and giving me an opportunity to share our story. Uh, the Kodiak Harvest Food Co-op was started in 2016 uh, and we began because of a desire from the community during a community planning day in 2015 for there to be a food mark here in Kodiak that really focuses on locally grown and sourced food. Um, being an island off the coast of Alaska, uh, nearly all of our food comes from thousands of miles away and we are very dependent upon um, you know, the success of food being brought in via air cargo or barge. And when there is inclement weather, we feel the real impacts of that here in Kodiak. Um, not only within the town of Kodiak, but throughout the island. Uh, I've lived here since 2018, and there's been numerous occasions where food hasn't arrived on time. And you see that result um, in a very real way in terms of completely empty shelves, um, no produce available except for maybe carrots or potatoes, um, some more shelf-stable root vegetables. Everything gets wiped out um, when there's a disruption to service. Uh, so Kodiak Harvest is working to address some of those concerns. And there's actually a fair amount of food that's available here on the island. Um, you know, our primary industry is seafood, um, but nearly all of that seafood gets shipped away and processed. Um, so we're working to um, not only arrange with local fishermen to sell their product direct to the consumers here in Kodiak, but to also work with local growers and local cottage food industry producers who are 
canning food or baking food um, that's available for sale on a smaller business scale and helping to get that into the hungry bellies throughout Kodiak. Um, a big part of our work is to address food security and scarcity issues throughout the island. Um, there's three communities on the road, road system uh, in the northwest corner of the island where Kodiak, the city, is located. But there's also six rural native villages around the island um, where the only access is by plane, um, a small plane, like a float plane, or by boat. Um, so we are working to support um, growing initiatives in those communities to help feed the natives in those villages as well. Um, since our inception, uh, we've worked diligently to grow our membership and being a small community on an island, we're really excited that we're now up to 545 members. Uh, really 500 was our threshold to prove uh, validity for opening a physical storefront location here in Kodiak. Uh, Kodiak Harvest started selling locally grown and um, Alaska grown produce in 2018 through um, booths at local events and at the weekly farmer's market and doing veggie pop-up stands. Um, our efforts, uh, you know, started out small and, it, and then that first year we sold a little over $9,000 worth of produce. Uh, we continued doing those stands in 2019, and we did increase our sales to about $12,600. And then in 2020, with the uh, rise of the COVID-19 pandemic, um, we saw a shift in what was needed in the community. You know, there's a lot of, um, with our older population in the community, um, a um, awareness of visiting the local grocery store, so we pivoted and we started offering a, veg, a weekly veggie box um, service uh, that was completely socially distanced. Uh, you know, they could order online and then there was a pickup location where they could come and um, they would let us know when uh, they had arrived to pick up their order and we would um, set it aside for them to come and pick up so that there was no interaction and people felt safe in getting the food that they needed. Um, that initiative was really um, well received within the community, and we saw a big increase in produce sales last year. Uh, we went from $12,600 in 2019 to $82,400 last year. Um, we have plans to reignite our veggie stands um, this summer uh, as the growing season really gets kicked off. And it, late last uh, fall, we received a local food protection program grant from the USDA to um, more officially establish a food hub um, and a small storefront location here in the city of Kodiak. So we're working on that right now. Um, and we have aspirations of having the location up before the end of this calendar year uh, with a grand opening. Um, and we're really excited for all of the um, work that's being done uh, with our producers and growers um, to expand what they're doing to help deliver fresh, nutritious food to the community and really addressing what our mission is and why the co-op here even exists. Um, I think that covers everything I wanted to share today, today but if you want Thank you, Christine, for keeping those videos rolling for us. Um, so we hope that these, these stories of dynamic rural communities creating their own futures um, helps others generate fresh ideas and develop some, some newfound motivation. Um, as, our, as a team, we were really, I think, inspired by the dedication of community members to respond to local needs. Um, we also observed some key ingredients present in many of these successful local initiatives. Um, the community efforts that we featured seemed to demonstrate just the right amount and the right blend of leadership and volunteerism 
Um, and these qualities appear to foster self-sufficiency by finding the right balance of this kind of cooperative spirit that enables creativity and entrepreneurism to thrive. Um, in our interviews and in our case study development, we asked community stakeholders to reflect back on their process and to share what they learned with others who are interested in pursuing similar projects or initiatives. Um, and the stories offer several lessons in common across the diversity of projects and geographies. We felt that the, the guidance they shared um, offers inspiration for embracing this new world as an energy to create sustainable and, and inventive and vibrant and thriving communities. Um, so we just wanted to spend a little bit of time summarizing what we learned today. Um, so first, interviewees from nearly every community we interviewed repeated that successful projects were um, founded by building strong community-wide diverse partnerships that facilitated collaboration and not competition. And I think you heard that in some of the video videos today. Um, so for example, with Black Belt Treasures, um, they shared that their success in using the arts as economic development is facilitated by their commitment to supporting all artists and arts-based organizations in the region. They also partner with numerous non-arts entities, including local governments and businesses and schools to lift a region of thriving communities beyond just Camden. And then similarly, the Relief Zone Community Youth Center, I think when they reflected on their, um, you know, almost two decades of community collaboration um, as, as being vital to their longevity, they've become an integral part of the community by uniting all of the town's churches, regardless of the denomination, um, on the, the commitment to supporting the community's youth. And by, by partnering with local government and the school district, um, successes really become shared successes. And then when emergencies arise, like um, you know, the COVID-19 pandemic, institutions already have this experience collaborating and problem solving together. Second, numerous community interviewees reported that in order to keep momentum going around these long-term projects, um, organizations and groups have to celebrate all of the incremental wins along the way. So, for example, Quimfer Village, which, which we didn't hear from today, but is one of our case studies, is a senior cooperative housing development, um, and we featured them in Washington County, and they reflected on how they knew that a lot of good housing cooperative projects just get completely stalled in the idea phase and never make it to construction. Um, so rather than letting that happen, they assigned members to working teams with responsibilities, and then progress in any team was celebrated by all the teams, and very frequently. Um, so they noted that um, the act of celebrating in and of itself builds community connections and goodwill. And especially when you're mixing in fun and, and music and food and dancing, um, it really builds social cohesion and, and the cement that holds a diverse um, community together. Um, the New Allen Alliance, which was a, another project that we featured um, in Indiana, which was a community-wide rural planning project, when they drafted their rural revival plan, um, they really took celebration to the next step. They celebrated successes with the, the community through press statements and newspaper articles and online announcements, all um, kind of announcing victories in the whole planning process. And this really kept momentum going throughout the, the planning process and then into implementation as well. Um, third, just like the importance of celebration, leaders from our case studies all emphasized that frequent and timely and clear communication was really vital to the success of projects. So that, that New Allen Alliance, when they um, created their, their regional planning process, they made the decision to dedicate a pretty significant portion of their budget to high quality communications materials that really promoted the region and the, the community's goals. Um, and similarly, like we heard from Black Belt Treasures, um, they have also invested really meaningfully in educating their community by sharing about their efforts often. So they engage local residents and the business community and local government officials, not just on supporting the arts, but on why the arts are important and what is unique about their specific craft-based heritage and, and how the arts can contribute to broader economic development goals. Um, each of our case studies reminded us um, that to fi find success, organizations and groups must be willing to, to grow and adapt to changing communities. So a lot of our interviewees stressed that 
um, the importance of listening to what the community is saying that their need is and then adapting to what that they say. Um, so being willing to change course, uh, course as needed. And I think we really heard that with the Relief Zone Youth Center, um, sharing about their the importance of evolving to stay relevant to community needs. So they really started on the premise that youth needed a safe place to stay on the weekends. Um, and their Saturday evening teen programming was really a mainstay of the organization for more than a decade. Um, but, but when participation in that program dwindled and the need for child care for younger children became you know, a really urgent need for working parents in the town, they made the decision to stop the Saturday night programming um, in favor of daycare programming and know, with the knowledge that evolving with their community was the best way to serve families. Um, and then I think we heard this in a lot of the videos today, but um, community interviewees all admitted that to get their projects off the ground, they had a lot of learning to do. So rather than reinventing the wheel, they spoke with other communities nationwide with similar ideas or goals, um, focused on utilizing technical assistance and, and communicating with other places. Um, and, I, and I think we really heard that with Black Belt Treasures as well, talking about attending conferences and and workshops that provide exposure to new cultures and ideas and help keep their own work fresh and help them develop contacts in the fields of arts development as well. Um, and then lastly, um, big changes in small communities often lead to a positive ripple effect um, that really sometimes can be unanticipated by the original group or organization. So efforts to address environmental or economic or social sustainability often become a spark or a catalyst for more long-term and widespread development. Um, and identifying and accounting for these waves is critical to building more success. And I think we heard that in Maine Grains and um, the story from Amber. While that project kind of started out as converting an abandoned building into a functioning grist mill, today the efforts have really tr triggered new development across Skowhegan with um, with downtown development and the annual bread kneading conference, a lot of tourist traffic, and all of these, these art um, efforts, I think, kind of reflect what Kodiak Harvest also has really latched onto, that um, true change comes from viewing every action as part of a long game. Um, and for efforts to really uh, light a community-wide spark, there has to be this dedication and attitude of playing the long game for really deep and, and sustainable change. Um, so it has... Um, really been a joy to develop these case studies and to share them with you. Um, we encourage you to visit our website and to check out both the collection of case studies and the Lessons in New Ruralism report to learn more about the specific projects and our, more of our observations of what, um, what makes successful rural development. Um, the case studies are all kind of chock full of details and photos and links and, um, and contact information for all of our case study communities. Um, and if you'd like to nominate your community or a community that you've heard about that's doing some great work um, or for their projects that you think might be a good fit, please reach out to us about featuring them. We would love to continue to grow our case studies um, and then our library there. And then, as Tara mentioned earlier, we are always looking to grow our volunteer team of folks who are interested in highlighting and featuring the great activities that are happening in rural communities. So. If you would, would like to help feature other stories, please reach out to us um, and we would, we would love to grow our team as well. Um, so the rest of the session will be open for question and answers, which are going to be facilitated through Christine in the chat box. So thank you so much for your, your time and attention today and for um, listening to the stories of communities that we've been featuring. Thanks. Okay, great. So folks, again, just type your questions in the chat box and uh, we'll see how many of these we can get to. Um, it looks like uh, the first one and, and folks, the, the, um, the folks that did the recordings aren't on the line. Um, so you can't ask them questions directly. There are a couple of those, uh, but hopefully we'll see if uh, our panelists here are able to answer on their behalf. So the first one, is uh, regarding our, our last case study in Kodiak. Um, do we know the success of the food co-op? Could it be attributed to the actual threat of food insecurity, or perhaps um, it was more of an interest just in local food? 
think Jenny's gonna have the most details on that fresh in her mind. Sure, I can give it a, give it a try, and I don't want to speak on behalf of communities too much, but I think it was a, a mix. There's a, an, certainly an interest in, in food systems and growing local food systems. I do think, though, in Kodiak, um, and we didn't get to see a lot of the pictures of the place, but it, it really is an island that is is extremely remote, and most of their food really was, you know, coming in through barges and through airplanes. And so I think um, the lack the lack of incoming food when there was a severe weather event, um, I, I do think probably contributed to folks' interest in building up um, a more, much more, a stronger local food system. And I do think that um, food insecurity was, it continues to be a pretty serious concern for a lot of the native villages that are um, like along several of those islands. So I think it was a dual goal there. Um, and, and certainly, uh, the, the COVID pandemic, I think, gave them a, a boost to focus even more locally. And again, where um, where can folks get information to just kind of follow up and see where some of these case studies are at? So the contact information is on each of the case studies on on the website so again uh googling apa new ruralism will will bring you to the site um some of them are getting a little out of date we've been working on this project for a while and um that's one of the things we hope to do as we build our volunteer team is is update the, the initial ones so that's the place to look and um did you say that there are opportunities for folks who think that um, maybe that they want to share their story, they can reach out to you um, and kind of become a case study. We are very eager to build our library. The more, the better. There's a there's a link on our website to put in some initial information, and then um, and then I would be the one to get back to people to, to ask more questions and, and then bring it to the group. And have you all noticed, have you been, um, has anyone contacted you reaching out looking for resources um, related to COVID? Um, are there any trends that anyone has noticed, particularly with small towns um, and COVID that are kind of seeping up right now? Joanne, you can probably speak from your own local experience. I. <laughs> I work for a number of towns um, and all in New Hampshire and New Hampshire's had some really good resources to help communities um, through the Municipal Association and Office of State Strategic Initiatives. Uh, but um, I would say no one has reached out to our New Ruralism team in that regard. Do you have anything to add, Joanne? Um, sure, I think that um, what I've seen is our communities sharing uh, information and ideas with one another, in particular, how did restaurants pivot from one town to another and whether, you know, one town's model of um, creating like a food system um, donation system. Uh, resource so that uh, uh, people could donate uh, money. The money went to the restaurants, the restaurants packaged food, and we were able to distribute meals to people who needed them. So that was um, that was kind of a, a great idea that was shared. Uh, it didn't doesn't necessarily work across every town, but um, so in terms of COVID, I think that we were sort of reaching out to our neighbors and, and seeing, you know, what's working. Um, on an emergency basis. The community I work in, we had a revolving loan fund that we were able to um, pivot very quickly and uh, turn around very small loans, a thousand, two thousand dollars to some of our local restaurants within one to two weeks so that they could have some resources available to them while they were waiting for their PPP loans. So that's probably probably a case study I should be adding to the <laughs> using your your USDA revolving loan fund. 
Um, and of the case studies so far, um, anything revolving around affordable housing? I know um, just in the general planning world, uh, affordable housing and really just the housing shortage in general is a big deal. Um, do any of your case studies focus on housing or specifically affordable housing? Not affordable housing specifically. Um, we have a couple that focused around um, helping people stay in their own homes as they age. Um, and Jenny can talk a minute about um, Quimper Village that was a housing focused project, though not, not affordable housing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think some of the areas in the case studies where we see the closest focus on that are around helping um, people age in place and be able to afford to stay in their own homes. Um, a lot of community programs that um, support um, retrofitting homes so that seniors are, are able to stay in their home longer. We did feature one um, senior house, uh, senior co-housing project that Tara mentioned. It wasn't focused on affordable housing for seniors. Um, it, it was based in, in Washington and Port Townsend. Um, but I do think that the, the issue of affordable housing in rural communities, especially for families, is going to continue to to come up over and over as an ongoing issue. So if folks have um, a stories of, of places that are doing really well in addressing affordable housing for families in rural communities, I would love to feature some more um, case studies in that area. I, I do think it's, it's a, a big issue. Okay, thank you. Um, next question. Um, I think Tara talked about the triangle of sustainability at the beginning, and one of the things she mentioned was that sustaining econo economically is to avoid money leaching from the community and keeping funds local. Can you speak to how communities um, uh, did this in their projects? We have a few case studies that um, focused on primarily, I'd say, food systems. And um, so but aside from the food systems, I'm also thinking about the Island Employee Cooperative on Deer Isle, Maine, where um, the workers actually bought the core businesses that were for sale. So rather than, um, you know, the local store being bought by some big chain, right, it's owned by the workers and then that income stays in the, in the community. I think we saw it more, I'd say with food systems where um, fresh catch and pork fried meat and, and others where you're cutting out the middleman and people are buying directly from from the providers from the fishermen from the farmers farmers market type approaches um, rather than selling through a middleman through a major grocery chain i think that's the most common way that we've seen i'd like to be that oh, sorry no, i was just gonna ask if you had anything to add to that <laughs> um, I'd kind of like to piggyback on that in, in that when we looked at our rural communities, um, uh, how distant uh, our small towns are from major metropolitan areas and uh, we're, we don't see ourselves as a adjunct or part of the uh, major metropolitan, you know, sprawl. And so our economies generally are very um independent from from that and that's where we find that we're building our strength is is recognizing our um, entrepreneurial spirit within the community to solve the needs um, right here in town so um, to one of the examples was Monadnock at home where uh, you know, we're helping our seniors stay at home, but we're also creating a database of services for the seniors so that they can tap into um, local contractors, um, ride shares, um, people who provide uh, tech support for, for computers and so on and so forth, and also activities so that 
um, th these are local folks who are willing to offer a discount uh, to be within the program and they're um, uh, insured and vetted through the program, through the Mad Knock at Home. Uh, it, so it, again, it's really building on that uh, local network of expertise and um, economy. And another example of that, I think, going beyond the food systems is the case study of the um, Plymouth um, Area and uh, Energy Initiative, uh, which, uh, as Terrace described at the beginning, was based on um, the old concept of a barn raising. So rather than bringing in uh, experience and um, con consultants from outside, we're building in the Plymouth, New Hampshire, they're building up a network of uh, local resources to expand renewable energy systems uh, in the community and beyond. So that's that's really where, where we're getting at. And I'm sure some of the folks that are on the call uh, recognize we, we when we took this project nationally, um, uh, you know, we were saying, oh, we're 40 miles from the major, a major metropolitan area. We're 60 miles from a major metropolitan area. And, you know, someone from, uh, you know, Wyoming or Montana said, well, that's, re that's really luxurious because we're 100 miles from the <laughs> nearest metropolitan area. And so, you know, local communities really see um, the importance of a strong, uh, sustainable uh, economy. Um, so, with the, the topic of economy, let's talk about workforce for, for a few minutes here. There's a couple questions related to that. And I know, at least here in Northeast Ohio, um, there's a lot of smaller towns that are having trouble um, getting employees that are trained, that are even not trained, that they're willing to train, that the workforce just is not there. And they're having, they're, they're struggling to keep their businesses open. And now you're adding the fallout from the pandemic on top of that, um, where there's just so many open positions right now in uh, restaurants, uh, local retail establishments are limiting hours or just having to close down because they don't have employees. And I, I feel like especially in rural and small town areas, um, you know, your pool is even smaller. How, how are communities dealing with this now? Do you want me to, I, I'll start off, I think. Um, a number of our projects or the case studies um, had training programs or peer-to-peer -peer training, um, which helps to expand that um, uh, knowledge base. But yes, we're all in, it seems like we're in this big national issue of needing affordable housing and needing workforce. And it's, 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 it's really a, a, going to be a tough nut to, to crack, but we we have found that um, we found the need for tradespeople, and and through some of these programs, I know in the island co-op and think about the black belt studios where there's training going on. Um, it, it we need to encourage people to continue on with their. Um, uh, secondary post post high school education to get to get this kind of training and I believe one of our speakers today said uh, also important um, that the skills that they were sharing were the soft skills and that's what I've heard from employers as well is I might be able to get a person but they don't realize they need to show up on time every day right so so um, as much as we can provide that kind of service um, and training in addition to the hard skills is is really important i think a lot of what we saw too is um not addressing that need but but growing businesses that, that are a match for the local skills and knowledge mm -hmm. like main grains and the black belt treasures are good examples of that of using the local resources to build the local economy uh, going in that direction one of one of the first uh, case studies that we looked at was up in northern New Hampshire, the Women's Entrepreneurial Network, REN. Mm -hmm. um, they they started out doing um, jobs training for, for women and especially focused on women who wanted to start their own business, who had a skill, a marketable skill, but not necessarily how to do a business plan and so forth. 
and um, that's grown over the years. They have an incubator now in Berlin. It's a really thriving organization. So I think that's more what we've looked at is um, matching up the local assets with the people and 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 the market. Um, let's step back and um, talk about aging populations, aging in place, um, creating or sustaining resources for our elderly population. How are small towns dealing with providing, I guess, not only affordable, but um, um, kind of retirement homes? Um, ADA accessible, single story, you know, they, they want to get, as this question states, they want to get off the farm now. Um, they want to move into a smaller place where they don't, you know, have to maintain a yard. Um, it's a single story, perhaps even assisted living. Um, those are a little harder to come by, perhaps, in smaller communities. Um, do you have any of the case studies that focus on um, you know, making sure that we meet those needs of our elderly population? We, we have case studies, um, and I'll, I'll turn it over to Duane to talk about Nan Knock at Home a little bit more, but um, that focus on pieces of that. But, but big picture, my answer is really no, because, um, you know, it's like affordable housing, all of the examples that we saw did depend on a major outside funding source or the tax credit program. And we were really trying to focus on locally grown solutions that, that weren't dependent, you know, that because we wanted examples where a community is trying to solve a problem, they can go to our library and get some ideas. So if there are people um, attending the webinar today who do have examples, we, we would really love to see those because, again, we've only seen pieces pieces of the problem um, solved. And Joanna, I don't know if you want to talk about Mananak at home a little bit more. Well, um, I think that Quimper Village in Washington State is um, a good example of, you know, it's a senior housing co-op um, where folks were able to you know, downsize like the um, person writing in the question, uh, they don't want to stay on the farm anymore. They were able to downsize and create their own community. Um, and I'm sure, f I'm hoping uh, that folks are familiar with the co-housing concept. Um, and um, I think that one of the lessons learned was um, uh, making sure that everybody has a job to do. You know, when you think about housing development, um, and you have a group of people together and you know they have a great idea but unless you have you know s sort of smaller groups with very specific um action items that they need to achieve in order to get to this co-housing solution uh, it's not going to happen so i think that was one of the lessons learned from quimper village in particular um but what they also um, created was their own recreation facilities they had a common house and and um, things like that which are which are common in in co-housing situations so I think that's that's one but I think that we could certainly use um, additional housing case studies that actually address um, how we get to affordable and as Tara said really the only way to in my view the only way to get to affordable is to have some kind of tax credits or outside funding coming in to offset the cost of construction and land acquisition we certainly have those kinds of you know through our uh, regional um, planning agencies and and community services um, groups who do building of that type but um, um, you just softballed have, yeah. me my next question. Um, can small towns and um, our rural areas, what what do planners in these areas need to know about the American Rescue Plan Act and how they can get their um, hands on some of the funds? What do they need to do? I would say reach out to the regional planning commissions would be my first answer. Joanne, did you have something more? 
Yeah, yeah, we have, um, we've been having um, bi-weekly meetings with our um, Division of Economic Development in the state of New Hampshire, and I'm sure that most states are, are reaching out in that way. Um, and uh, and also through the Federal Small Business Administration, SBA, has been uh, very helpful in putting out um, uh, all of the programs on an easy to access website. So what I've been doing in my, in my community is making sure that we're pushing out that information. So it goes to our website, to our Facebook page. I share it with our Main Street program with the Chamber of Commerce and the Regional Chambers of Commerce. Um, I've also brought in our local SBA for a Zoom call for folks to just ask questions, questions and answers. How do I get my PPP? How do I get my uh, restaurant reopening? How do I get my venue reopening um, money? Um, so I think as as much as we can network with those resources, um, we're going to do a better job of getting the funds out. There, There's a lot of funds available and um, it's it's kind of daunting i think for small businesses um so if they know that there's someone else out there you know you know just by your side that's that's sometimes that's all you need is just be by their side um so the the 2020 census um i don't know if you have any case studies or any uh information on how our smaller communities fared in responding to the census um and i believe I believe the the first batch of good information is coming out i think at the end of september or maybe october um what do what do we need to know what do our small towns um need to look for um is, is there anything that they should be preparing for ahead of time ahead of getting some of these numbers things like that um thoughts my first thought it, I work with a lot of small communities who are trying to reinvent their economy. Um, in Northern New Hampshire, especially, they lost the paper mills over some years and they're still struggling, a lot of them, to try to um, rebuild from that. So, you know, one thing I'd say is if don't get discouraged if you saw that you lost more population. You, you still are an amazing place with, with great resources to build on. Joanne, Jenny, thoughts? I think too, I've been kind of tracking um, some of the things that have been coming out from the publication, The Daily Yonder, um, which I'm sure a lot of our rural um, folks are familiar with around kind of some of the first data that's coming out in the census and, and how um, places will be designated as, as metro or non-metro. And so I think continuing to follow a lot of that, um, that work. And I think the APA has done quite a bit of advocacy around um, some of those designations and changes. Um, so I think I'm, I'm very curious to see what comes out in September. And I think a lot of um, folks looking at, look, working at the community level will be as well. Um, I'm not sure, Joanne, if that's something that you're um, seeing pop up where you are at all. Um, I have. I have I have not because I know that we're we're waiting on the data. I don't think that I'm going to be terribly surprised with the numbers. We know where we're tracking, um, at least in, in my region, uh, older popula you know, an aging population, and out migration of of younger folks. Um, so that that's not I don't see that changing for us and um, so again our community development and sustainability plans are, are based on trying to be attractive um, uh, and not just an outpost. We've actually seen um, a lot of people moving north um, in northern New England into into vacation homes buying up property that's been on the market for years We've got a lot of um, COVID migrants, mm -hmm. and the census isn't gonna be able to tell us whether how many of them are gonna stay um, year round. So I think there's gonna be a big missing piece in a lot of rural areas in this data. I, I think actually, yeah, actually, to to um, 
put a little bit more uh, finer point on it, I think it's important for rural communities to be attentive, depending on where you are in the country, um, not just of COVID migration, but of climate migrants. And I think over the long term, in the last, in the next five to 10 years, um, we, we could potentially be seeing a change in demographics, uh, depending on where you are. You know, we're in New England, um, we're not going to have some of the more uh, devastating effects of, of climate change. Um, so, you know, I, th I think as rural communities, you need to be attentive to, you know, what, what the impacts globally, well, nationally are, and, and whether you think that um, you're an attractive place for people to migrate to and or perhaps migrate from. So. And um, to that, we have to wrap up, but I guess this is a plug for, we do have an upcoming session um, regarding Zoom towns um, and folks are leaving, they're migrating, and it'll be interesting to see if they're going to stay or return. Um, so uh, be sure to register for that. It'll be coming up soon. I don't even think I have it listed yet um, on our webpage. Um, but it's 2.30, we have to wrap up, and we still have so many great questions just kind of um, regarding population shrinkage, transportation in rural areas. There, There's so much more information uh, yep. that, that we really need to get into. So um, obviously we need to continue this conversation. So we need STAR to come back with another session for us <laughs> so that we can, we can keep this moving. Uh, thanks to all of you. For, for joining me today, um, for all of our case studies, and this is another PSA. You know, if you are working on uh, with a small community and, and you want to be a part of this case study, make sure you reach out um, to, to get this ever growing um, clearinghouse uh, up and running. So, thanks to you all. Thanks to the Small Town and Rural Planning Division. Um, this was great. We are recording this. It'll be up on our YouTube channel. We'll have a PDF copy of the presentation up on our webcast webpage, which is also where you can register for our upcoming sessions, ohioplanning.org slash planningwebcast. So thanks to all of you. Uh, everyone have a great weekend and we will talk next time. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Christine.